Good afternoon, I think. No, no, it's still morning. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, please uh, uh, go ahead and take your seats. I hope you were able to get some refreshments and enjoyed your, uh, your last sessions at the Power and Solidarity Summit. Uh, just as a quick question to start us off, did everyone enjoy the summit? <laughs> Woo! Great. I, I, I know I speak for our entire teams, and we'll talk a little bit later about the, uh, just the wonderful feedback we've been hearing from everyone, and we really um, appreciate you joining us for this uh, powerful conversation to end this, and this is really about solidarity today. Um, I wanted to uh, take a moment um, to just share personally why this next panel matters to us in Indian country. While I was in the Tribal Nations Initiative update, we just received some news. Um, and the, the threats that we're seeing to sovereignty are mounting. Uh, Well-resourced and uh, are, the threats to sovereignty are mounting. They're well-resourced and they're powerful. Just today, the Supreme Court released an opinion in Oklahoma v. Castro Huerta, which seriously rolled back a landmark 2020 ruling that affirmed tribal authority over tribal lands. This literally just came in this morning. Come, yeah, boo, indeed. Um, Coming off the devastating ruling on Roe, we know that there is more to come. Concerted efforts to undermine tribal sovereignty threaten our most hard-won legislation, like the Violence Against Women Act and the Indian Child Welfare Act. And even worse, it's threatening our very sovereignty in this country. Investing in the power of the people to change the courts is more important than ever for all of us. And I think we're all feeling that. I just wanted to share that because I know a lot of um, us in Indian country are seeing this news roll through on our phones, and I think it's a really important um, thing to share as we talk about civic engagement, because this is more important to all of us than ever, and I'm just really excited to start this panel. Um, so I'm, uh, for those of you uh, who've been in the conference, I'm Eric Stegman, I'm the CEO here at Native Americans in Philanthropy. And um, in my previous life, I was uh, the ED of the Center for Native American Youth at the Aspen Institute, and that's where I met Sue Van. Uh, at, at CNAY, we did a lot of work in uh, leadership development with young leaders across the, t the, uh, the country, and I was asked by my friend Janine Kamenot, who was the founder and executive director at the National Urban Indian Family Coalition, you gotta come meet Sue Van. And she brought a bunch of us together in Washington, D.C. at a meeting about the census and asked us about whether or not we had the Indian Dream Team to really achieve something different with the census and beyond that, voter engagement. And I learned a lot more about Sue and the Wallace Age Culture Foundation and the incredible work that she's done over the years. And a lot of us are new to her work, uh, relatively speaking, in tribal communities across the country, but it's powerful. And we thought that if we were gonna really lift up and share the story of a funder who really understands solidarity between our communities, uh, Pat and I immediately thought of Sue and the Wallace H. Coulter Foundation. So I'm really excited to kick off this conversation together with uh, some of our partners on the ground in the AAPI and Native communities across the country who have seen the direct impacts of the Wallace H. Coulter Foundation's investments over many years. And to start this off, I wanna go ahead and introduce Sue Van and ask, um, Sue, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and the work you're doing, and most importantly, this amazing strategy that you've developed with our communities over these many years? Sure, good morning. Hi, everyone. First, for your information, what is unique about me being here? is I don't speak at other people's conferences. I only speak on my own. But I could not forsake this opportunity because Coulter is the biggest funder for the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander community. And I believe we are also the biggest funder for Indian country in reference to the census, voter engagement. So since this is the first of a 30-year anniversary of APIP and NAB being together, I felt it was my obligation to actually be here and explain how the Wallace H. Coulter Foundation has built these two communities to work together for success. One of the things about me and the Coulter Foundation is I'm going to be sunsetting 
in the first quarter of 2025. It was never intended to be a perpetual foundation. In fact, I was going to sunset in 2021, but because of the pandemic and all the anti-Asian hate and violence that came about, I felt that I would do irreparable harm if I sunset in 21. So, and this is my first, my only, and my last foundation and experience in the nonprofit world. I don't come from your world. I did not grow up in the Asian community. So I come from industry, and the reason you have in front of you on the desk is my handout of this gentleman, which you can see that he didn't spend a whole lot of money on clothes, right? <laughs> Was the inventor of the Coulter counter. Every single one of you have had a blood test and will have blood tests throughout your life. He is the inventor. And if he did not invent this, healthcare would not be accessible and affordable for the world because it enabled clinicians and clinics to be able to do from 1,000 blood counts a day to 10,000. So a little bit about me is I come from business and industry. I run two foundations who are going to sunset and therefore we think a little differently. And why do we fund both the AA and HPI and AIAN communities? Because when I met them, they were invisible and they were, had no voice and they had no seat at the table and they were excluded and only getting, both of them, less than two tenths of 1% of annual philanthropy, which is over $85 billion. So that's why we do what we do. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much, Sue. Um, we're really looking forward to uh, learning more about the real stories from this uh, work that you've been doing with all of our communities uh, over the years. Next, I'd like to um, ask Christine, can you tell us a little bit more about who you are and what brought you to this work and the work you're doing, and you know, what have you been doing with the Culture Foundation over these years? Right, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm Christine Chen, Executive Director for Asian and Pacific Islander American Vote. Been now in DC for almost 28 years, but it's been a gift because I've been able to see the community grow and build its political ecosystem. And, um, you know, with API Vote, when we first got started, it was because we acknowledged that even as the community was growing, we didn't necessarily um, have the same power as other communities because our API voters were not voting and registering at the same rate as other communities. And so even though we had more players when we first started, there was only four national API um, advocacy organizations to now there's about 39 national groups that are representing a wide variety of different issues. Um, the key was that we really need to build our political power, working with local trusted um, communities and messengers on the ground to ensure that we increase registration and um, turnout. So I think the biggest gift, one of the biggest gifts that Sue and the Culture Foundation has provided is that they proved that the API community is one of the fastest growing communities in, the, in this country. And as a result of that, we have the power to have substantial and decisive impact on the elections. Because it all started out with the 2010 census. Before that, there were very few foundations were investing in our community. So when Sue came in November of 2009 with this gift of, was it three, four million dollars, for us to quickly scale up in the next two or three months for the 2010 census, that actually led to us to actually build a network of community-based organizations quickly that work together with one goal to get counted. And as a result, we had one of the lowest undercounts um, during that time period. And from there, we were able to then shift our work from getting counted in the census to building an infrastructure for um, voter participation. So after, you know, I, I'm actually one of the first people that Sue had worked with at that time as a consultant, and then later on as a executive director of API Vote. The biggest gift she gave me after that election was she didn't know anything about the elections, but she saw what we did um, and what I did with the census 
She's like, okay, heading to 2012, I'm going to give you a half million dollars to invest and in sub-grant to the community so that way they can actually scale up and do their work. So that was the first time, once again, that we were, were, we were provided a substantial amount to be able to sub-grant and, once again, create a cohort and a community together that we can not, not only are we being invested in, but we're also building an ecosystem where we're um, giving them training, providing them with consultants, so that way they understand how to quickly um, engage in this world, right? The other thing with these investments on, was that she decided to make sure this, these are long-term investments. So this is not just a one-off. So most of the contracts are always at least a minimum of three years. So it allows an organization to think bigger, plan strategically, and to also invest in their people. Um, I think many times we're so focusing on doing the work that we forget that we also have to invest in our own organization. I know personally for API Vote, we finally got a development officer, we've doubled our staffing, and as a result, we have more capacity to be able to better serve all of our grantees and our, the groups that we work with. It also provides us the credibility because with other funders, they see that the Culture Foundation has also invested in us. Um, so those are some of the things, that, but there's a lot more that I could be talking about with culture, but let's, let's continue the conversation. Wow, well that's just, uh, I mean, that's just scratching the surface. And, you know, I love what you said about community because I, 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 that 2010 census moment is really what brought so many of us together with Sue. I'll never forget um, when Janine Kamenout, the, the founder and ED at NUIFC, called me because we've been good friends for a long time in the field. She's like, you've got to meet this woman. And I think you two had been at a Democracy Alliance or some conference together. Like I had the most in-depth conversation about our communities with someone not from our communities that I've had in a long time. She gets us. We got to pull this meeting together. It was around the census. And so much of this happened as I was uh, uh, you know, working with our youth leaders that we received some of this pass through funding too. We were able to just pay youth leaders who were already working in their communities through my center and in partnership with all our partners to do the work. And we'd never really had that opportunity, or especially around the census. And so I'm going to go to you next, Rio, because we had been doing that in partnership with NUIFC. And I think the fact that Sue was able to find a partner organization like yours and bring us together and, you know, bring this dream team together was uh, the beginning of something really different and uh, would love to hear more about your partnership with the Culture Foundation. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Rio Fernandez. I am the Director of Civic Engagement with the National Urban Indian Family Coalition uh, and an enrolled member of the Lower Elwha Kralum Tribe. Um, on the note of kind of how Coulter has kind of changed NUIFC, the work we've been able to do. As the director of civic engagement, I've actually had a like a firsthand opportunity to watch and really see the difference that it's been able to make. Um, for us and the work that we do with different urban Indian nonprofits around the country, it's allowed our organizations to really change the way they think about civic engagement. I think a lot of people in the nonprofit space can relate to everyone understands the importance of civic engagement, but when you have so many responsibilities, when you have such a, uh, a tight budget, it kind of gets pushed to the back of the uh, uh, to the back of the priority list to sort of a, if we have time, we can get to it. And in that space, um, with the amount of work that our centers are doing, with the um, lack of resources, the overworkedness that they are going through, that usually just means it doesn't get done. So having the opportunity from Sue and Coulter Foundation to be able to give real resources and commit real uh, support to making sure that civic engagement um, can be done and really focused on has revolutionized and really changed how our organizations are able to think about it and involve in that work. Uh, so I think for us anyway, it really fits into two major categories. So the first one is around election season, where our organizations are really able to hit it out of the park, do amazing big initiatives, uh, you know, large events, um, be really creative with the funding that they're able to have, and really around election season mobilize, organize, and make an impact around the um, final vote counts. But I think the bigger thing for me, especially as someone that thinks a lot about civic engagement, is that our centers now, with support from Coulter Foundation, are able to think about civic engagement more holistically, are able to think about it as a 12-month project, not a, you know, it's the end of July, it's time for us to start ramping up civic engagement. Our organizations are now able to be thinking in January, in February, in March, all around 12 months out of the year, how are we thinking about civic engagement? How are we incorporating this into our work because of the support and funding that Coulter is able to provide us? So I think that is definitely the biggest change um, 
that we've been able to receive and the, the influence and, and support that Coulter's provided is that we have been able to change how we view civic engagement and are able to make it something ingrained into everything that we do. Thanks so much, Rio. Uh, one of the things that I think we've been hearing uh, across this conference, which was very intentional when our organizations came together, is that we want to truly honor each of the identities and communities that make up, you know, the acronyms that we have to uh, use for better or for worse. Um, and one of the other things that I just so appreciated in learning more about Coulter's investments was that they were actually investing in Pacific Islander and Native Hawaiian communities, which is just so hard to find. So Tabe, can you tell us a little bit more about the work that you've been doing uh, with the Coulter Network? Sure, thank you, uh, Eric. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tavai Matalasi Leolofoleatua Samwalu. My pronouns are she, her. I am Simeone and Ailawa's daughter. Uh, my favorite humans in the world call me Auntie Vai. And I spend most of my waking hours as the executive director of Empowering Pacific Islander Communities, also known as EPIC. Um, I was born and raised on Tongva land, and I credit a lot of my own political identity formation and my understanding of the importance of rematriating the land to Lishan Ohlone elders um, who've been critical in reminding me that it's not enough to acknowledge that there's a critical um, and important part that I play as an uninvited guest on this land um, to return it, uh, to dedicate time and commitment to that. Um, my relationship with the Coulter Foundation, Auntie Sue actually predates me. She has a longer relationship with Epic than I do. It's one that I inherited from one of Epic's founders, Sefa Aina, and it was really clear to me the role that Coulter has played in being a foundational and fundamental support to Epic as an organization and the entire Pacific Islander community as an ecosystem. Uh, my entire tenure at Epic for nearly five years has really been shaped by Auntie Sue, uh, someone who's challenged me and been really clear <laughs> uh, as both a cheerleader and somebody who pushed. Um, really, the hallmark of it was this 2000, it was funded in 2012, a demographic profile, community of contrast, that was a partnership between Epic and Asian Americans advancing LA. And it was a challenge that Sue issued after hearing time and time again from very vocal and ardent Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander elders who said, we need this. We need data disaggregation. We need our own profile. We need to be able to tell our own stories. So Sue made this significant investment. And after seeing the report, after being prodded, from what I understand, <laughs> by Susie, um, read it. And I think it was this, you know, I, Sue has told me time and time again that it was the report that convinced her of the importance of data disaggregation. Data disaggregation, not just as, a, not a luxury, but a necessity to actually getting what we need for our communities and moving us closer to equity. After that, there was, I would say that Coulter is actually an early investor, an early adopter of Epic. There was a lot of trust that she had placed in this young organization that to many hadn't necessarily proven itself yet, but she said that she was gonna go all in and she stuck around. Um, I think trust-based philanthropy in my relationship with Coulter and Sue has looked like not needing to always perform or put our best on display, but she's seen all of our growing pains, some of the wounds that we would have otherwise been ashamed of and stuck around, and in fact invested more and quicker um, and left us alone to do our work and trusted that we knew best and were the experts. And the other reason, that in the Pacific Island, we affectionately call her Auntie Sue <laughs> as one of the only elders who can get us all in the room together and put a clear foot down and said, you all have to be united in this. Uh, was adamant about knowing that our tensions are one thing, but not to let them distract us from the ultimate goal of getting power for our communities. And it has continued to be something that allows us to come back, to come back together and to continue building that power as a collective. Wow, that's so powerful, thank you. Um, you know, Sue, I'm gonna go back to you. Let's um, dig in a little bit more to how you've done this work. You know, you've got a really unique approach 
to how you've invested in this work. I remember uh, in being part of the partnership with the NUIFC, uh, you were one of the first funders that really uh, not only was doing re-granting, but also these challenge grants. And what I thought was really interesting was how you worked with some of these organizations to help them understand the power of a funder like that coming in and putting money up on the table, but challenging other funders to kick in. So I know that you've got a lot of different strategies. Can you help us uh, paint the picture on how you develop this approach and what you've learned from it over the years? Sure, I would say that when we entered into this space of grant making, I knew nothing, okay? Less than nothing. I come from the for-profit community. I come from medical diagnostics. But one of the things that was important to me is that my company was number one in the world, not in the US, in the world, number one for over 50 years. And one of the things that I share with all my grantees and partners, if I invest this in you, I have to trust you. You have to be the one with the wisdom where to spend it, who to spend it on, and what to do. I don't know. This is all new to me. Nonprofit, grant making, your communities are all new to me. So I have no idea. But at the end of the day, you have to do civic engagement. You can do everything else, including civic engagement. You can buy a car. I don't care if you paint a house, but you have to do civic engagement because it will make you visible. And when you are visible, you have the voice and you have the seat at the table. So in reference to the challenge grants, it's because I found in the Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Island community, a horrible at fundraising. I mean, really horrible, okay? So I thought, hmm, I don't understand this. Because many of the board members of these organizations are from business, and they're very successful professional people. And they know if they get invited by a mainstream nonprofit, the only reason they're being asked to join the board is for writing a check. But for some reason, these same people get on the board of an Asian organization, a Pacific Islander organization, and they change. Therefore, to be perfectly blunt, I wasn't gonna let them get away with it, okay? The main responsibility for a board, ladies and gentlemen, is raising money for you so you can do your jobs. Yes, they help you a little bit in governance, but you know they can't come in and run your organization, so their job is to fundraise for you. So we gave a challenge match, and each match was attributed to the board and to the ED and staff. We tried to educate people, everyone is a fundraiser. If you love your work, and you love to do what you want to do for the community on their behalf, it's fundraising. If you're proud of all the services you give, it's fundraising. Whether you give food, whether you give assistance in citizenship, it's fundraising. And if you believe in what you do, then you can fundraise for your organization. So the challenge match, we require that each year we will only match new funders, which gave the opportunity for the organization to get more visibility with a wider range of funders. So there were three components of our grant. One, here's the money to invest in yourself. Number two, Here's extra money to invest in your community. Because if we fund you, we want your community to benefit as well. So build a pan-Asian coalition within your community so you can be a team, so you can work together, you can be a cohort, so you can support each other and everybody will be loyal. And the third was a board matching grant to help fundraise because we always knew we were gonna sunset. And therefore, I needed to make sure that each and every organization we supported would be able to succeed without COTRA's funding. That's great. Thanks so much for that um, helpful rundown in, 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 in how the approach to this has affected these organizations. And I actually want to put that back to um, the others. How have you all changed your approaches over the years with, through your partnership with Sue and, and Coulter, have you learned any new strategies? Uh, what sorts of things have you heard back from your communities about this kind of funding, funding in this approach? 
I was just trying to shake it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, so it, once again, it goes back to how we rethink about how we run our, you know, choose our board members, um, how we also um, invest in our own individual staffing and also how we're structured. So, you know, in the beginning, I was working with my team and we're just running around, you know, focusing on the programming. But it was because of Sue's deep knowledge in our institution. Once again, like what Tavai was saying, she wasn't about to run away just because we're not, you know, we're going through um, growing pains. She was there to help us give advice because she's tr truly curious about our organization and our strategies. We were forced to answer her questions because she was trying to learn <laughs> about our community, our organizations. But I think that also um, challenged us to think is like, oh, how are we answering this? Oh, I haven't thought about that in a while. Maybe we need to th rethink about that strategy, right? And so even when it came to um, increasing our staffing, that the first priority, Sue was like saying, you need to get a development officer and take care of your back end office because <laughs> how are you going to be able to um, approach new funders if you don't have your own um, things in order, right? And so that, that just allowed us to s switch our thinking and reprioritize re and make room for things that we need to think of and, and act versus before just running from campaign to campaign to campaign, right? Yeah, and I think we, we, um, we certainly heard that in, in some of what Rio was talking about and being able to like think way further ahead and in a more sustainable way. And Devai, I, I loved your story about why your community started to call her Auntie Sue. And you know, I think we experienced the same thing I remember at that table where it's like, we're not always challenged to have to explain ourselves in a way that's you know, from that loving position, right? That's Because there's a lot of stuff that's really complicated outside our own space and communities. Um, so uh, one of the other things um, I wanted to actually just uh, go back to you, Sue, about is when, what are some of the things that you've actually learned from these organizations and this strategy as you've uh, moved forward in this work? Because you've been doing it for many years, but you know, you've seen a lot of progress. Um, you've brought new partners on board. Would just love to hear you know, what you've learned and what lessons you have for other funders, especially as you're sunsetting. You know, we need other funders to come in and do this kind of work. Well, I would say that one of the things and the people are always asking me, what influences your thinking? I was an immigrant, and I came in 1952, when there were less than 260,000 Asians, whether it's Chinese, Japanese, or Korean, in the United States. Can you imagine how I stuck out? Therefore, the issue of exclusion is very personal to me. I faced prejudice and discrimination my entire life. Because when you're the one and only, and you're the first, you will always be excluded. So I understand personally what it means to be excluded, number one. Number two, my father was a busboy. I'm the first to go to college. I'm the first to go to school. My mother and my father had no education. They truly, really, really were the poor immigrants. So I understand but a person or a family or an individual does not have resources and they don't have the financial capability to think about sending their kids to school. And one of the things that touched me about both three of these communities is they don't get funded. They don't get funded. And I said, why? Why aren't you funded? And I said, okay. You don't get funded because you don't have power. You have no influence. You have no reach. Therefore, what attracted me to these communities is they were excluded and they had no voice. They had no seat at the table and they didn't fund it. That to me, I identify with. I may not totally identify with the Asian American community and I didn't know anything about the native Hawaiians or Pacific Islanders. And I knew much, much less about Indian country. But I was really happy and wanted to learn. I wanted to learn about the problems, because how would I know? They're the experts. I don't know anything. So I asked great questions. And people used to say, 
Uh, watch out for Sue's questions. She'll be here for three <laughs> days asking you questions. <laughs> and I would say to them, yes, however, if I ask your questions, do not tell me where you are failed. I don't care if you fail. If you fail, that's where you're going to learn. That's how you learn. Make a mistake. Take risks. I don't care. Just deliver the civic engagement program. Not for me, for you, for your family, for your community. You want visibility? This will give it to you. So it is not that I thought about civic engagement per civic engagement. I thought of it in a way to become visible. It is a tool. Civic engagement is a tool. It's a resource. It's a mechanism. It's a weapon to be more visible and therefore to have greater reach. So I would say my own personal life as an immigrant and the challenges that I had, and because of my family not being having the opportunities that exist today, all the services, all the opportunities, I was very, I identify with the community. I identify with each and every community who's been invisible and who hasn't had a chance because all they need and all we need is an opportunity. And I knew that if I invested in them because I trust them, I believe in them, I know we can work hard. We are used to working hard, especially when you have no resources and nobody's funding you. Therefore, those are the opportunities for me. Not being funded was an opportunity. For me, them being vis invisible was an opportunity. You know, for me, for the fact that they uh, need the resources, so forth, was an opportunity. And to be perfectly candid, I had the American dream. Yes, I worked hard to get it. Nobody gave it to me free. But I had the American dream. And therefore, it is my obligation and responsibility to help as many other people as I can to get the American dream. And I think a lot of that is what helps me and inspires me and leads me to do what I do. Uh, thanks so much for sharing that. Um, Tavai, I, um, I wanted to go back to you to talk data and invisibility and how we matter and count when it comes to bringing our networks together. I think one of the things that really inspired me in, in learning more about your work was this early investment in, in data and thinking about how we try to go beyond that asterisk and that invisibility. Uh, what, what message do you have for funders and the audience about how to make our voice matter, how to build more meaningful engagement with your people and really change the landscape where you know we're part of the, you're part of the power building. Thank you for that question, Eric. There are a couple of things I, I heard that I, I, I want to try to reframe. Um, and reframe really is a compliment to Coulter. Um, this, this notion of being invisible or voiceless. I think the difference is culture actually approached us with a great deal of curiosity and that it's not necessarily that we didn't have voices, it's that you listened. You listened and you moved. You listened and you moved quickly and were willing to keep listening. Even if you disagreed, even if it didn't match the narratives that you had. And I think it's a huge compliment to work with folks who are willing to change their mind and understand that data is a tool for that. Um, the aspect of data and why it is such a critical part of Epic's DNA as an organization is that as young, young-ish, I don't know, there's some argument about whether or not 30-something is young. I'm going to take it. Um, I think so, but honestly, as I was telling the origin story of Epic, we had one of the founder's daughters interning with us. And she was like, oh, I remember, they weren't young. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> all right, hurt my feelings, Gen Z. Um, but no, to, I digress. I think all of it was also to say that as these leaders went and visited with elders and asked this question, one, for permission to start Epic, and two, what were they uniquely positioned to offer to the community? And elders had been telling so many stories for decades about high rates of cancer, about heart disease, about diabetes, all of these things that folks were saying made our communities inherently unhealthy or statistically insignificant. And they told our elders, where are your numbers, right? This desire to quantify suffering. What the profile did is actually bring that data. 
and say, we've had stories and narrative, right, for millennia. It's why we ex I exist, because somebody told a story. What we needed was data. We needed numbers, right? And what do we understand about data? Data is not neutral. Data is a tool like anything else. Data in the hands of white supremacy will do white supremacist things. But when we're equipped with data, we said, this is the story we are gonna tell. We're not going to tell you that our communities are inherently obese. We're gonna tell you about what happens when you take away land so people cannot take care of themselves and have their traditional food ways, right? We, sh we place the inquiry. Yeah. Thank you. The report placed the inquiry on systems. And so what shifted is that as we utilize that data to inform all of our approaches long term and decide what is it our community needs. So these pillars that shape Epic are built on that data, right? 75% of NHPI said no party ever, whether they were high propensity or not, had ever been reached out to. So that became, we were phone banking. The, one of the first phone banks they did was in 2016 after the significant culture investment they did in Tongan. 70% is our turnout rate. 70% of the people we talk to go vote. So we know when we talk to our people, they move. And we don't talk to them about civic engagement the same way people others do, because we know democracy is actually part of our colonial inheritance. What is a Tongan monarchy or a native Hawaiian monarchy that was overthrown by the US care about democracy? So instead, we tell our people, you need to voice the voyage. These systems that disadvantage us are not going to change unless you engage. And in addition to voting, we need you to do everything else, too. And I think the other uniqueness about Coulter Foundation, you didn't have to already be a civic engagement foundation. The primacy that they gave us, like, you just need to be API and willing to work. And so health foundations came in, education foundations, all of these folks, this cross-sector approach that understood you may prioritize this issue area, you need to understand that civic engagement is a tool. Right? And the last piece I'll say in closing this out, this demographic profile, the other part that was really unique about culture is that Epic was our own measuring stick. It wasn't do things like Asian Americans or aspire to whiteness. It was what is the best that Epic can deliver for the Pacific Islander community. So this demographic profile that was released in 2014 is still circulated widely, is still something our communities rely on. And it took two years. Every other profile took six months, but that two years is the buy-in we needed to be able to get our communities invested and so that they would trust us to tell their stories and do the work they need us to do. Could I add a Please. little? I want you to know that my Asian American partners try to explain to me this aggregated data. <laughs> but somehow, they one in here, one out the other, and I couldn't get it. I only got it from reading the Pacific Islander Native Hawaiian profile because it was so clear regarding morbidity, regarding diseases, regarding education and housing that I never understood it before except for that demographic profile. So it taught me a lot that impacts your community. But as an example, in Hawaii, I don't fund Asian American groups. I fund Native Hawaiian groups. Because always remember, wherever you're at, it doesn't mean that the population that could be in need in another area is in fact the same. So in Hawaii, I support Native Hawaiians. But I would have to say that I pay a lot of attention to Pacific Islanders because the Native Hawaiians are in a bigger community than Pacific Islanders. So I think the question of who is at the table and who is not at the table changes when you go from state to region to countries or so forth. And the thing is to have an open mind to say who is not at the table. And it's not pure Native Hawaiians because you have to pay attention to Pacific Islanders. So I have to say for the 2020 census, we had 23 languages that were translated for the census. Eight of them were Pacific Islanders, Native Hawaiian out of 23. So we really do have to pay attention to the uniqueness and to the diversity in reference to all the communities. And I think I'll start real with something that fascinated me about Indian country, that there's a tribal 
rural, and there's an urban. And I guarantee you, most of you sitting out there didn't know, maybe before this conference, that 60 to 70 percent of Native Americans are in the cities. So they're really invisible. So if you don't mind, I think I'll have real talk about that particular portion, the, about the urban and the tribal, because I think that's uh, maybe information that most people, most funders, at least would not know. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, that's a big part of what the NUIFC was created to address. That's a big part of what Janine's vision and dream when she created the NUIFC in 2003 was for, was to advocate and really uh, center in urban native voices and the organizations that do so much of that work. And I think um, you had mentioned when you were talking about funding and, and you know the word you kept using, I think, was opportunity. And I think about that one all the time, especially in regards to funding and organizing within the urban native spaces. We know that the urban native vote has the ability to be the swing vote. We know how close elections can be. I think uh, a lot of election observers, smart political people always talk about, you know, if you move one percentage point this way or it move it around a little bit, you can have a completely different election result. But then these same people then don't bother actually investing, connecting, organizing, or thinking about native votes or, or underserved communities. They're communities they've always just assumed we're gonna vote for them or just take for granted, and then are surprised when these small margins are the result that end up changing an election. I think it was in Minnesota, for example, um, through the census work, I think Minnesota kept a congressional seat by like a ridiculously small margin, like a thousand people or something like that. If they had not counted those people, they would have lost a congressional seat. Arizona, for example, I think was decided by 10,000 votes. Nevada was 30,000 votes. Like these are small, small margins that I think everyone is aware exists, but often don't think about or decide to speci uh, specifically focus on one set of swing voters or one set of demographics that they think are the ones that are worth trying to convince or the ones that are worth trying to reach out to and then leave out all of our communities. And so I think that that is something that when we think about um, organizing and the funding and the work that can be done, there is just this huge amount of potential that can be tapped into because they've just been, our communities have just not been reached out to in that regard. It's, it's that opportunity that you, you mentioned so much and so eloquently about. Thanks so much, Rio. Um, Christine, I wanted to go back to you to um, talk a little bit about the moment we're in right now. You know, I, I know everyone here um, has been seeing these horrible headlines with these anti-Asian hate incidents, and so many communities are dealing with these kinds of things. How is that impacting you and your work right now? You know, if you can just share a little bit more about that. Well, you know, the our local partners on the ground, they haven't stopped. Um, Everyone else has had the luxury, but they're still, they never had the luxury of stepping back. They had to still be out there engaging with the public just despite of the rise of anti-Asian violence as well as the pandemic. But I think we were probably in a better position. Um, our, our community organizations were in a better position to handle what was handed to us in 2020 because of the long-term investments of the Culture Foundation, right? And so we had a network of nonprofits that were already invested. We had an infrastructure. We had the coalitions. Um, heading into 2020, we also knew that it was only once every 20 years that we had the census and the presidential election happening at the same time. So we started early with 50, over 50 regional trainings and developing relationships with our partners on the ground. So that way, by January 1 of 2020, we were able just to focus on implementation. So then when the rise of anti-Asian violence and the pandemic um, came about, we were able to quickly help them pivot and they were able to pivot. They were able to you know, talk to the Culture Foundation instead of utilizing these funds for XYZ, can we use it to feed people in our community? Can we just pivot to, to meet the needs that are immediate? And they were able to go about and, doing, and do that. Also, I think 2020, because of our partners doing that regular engagement, whether it is um, you know, for the pandemic or the rise of anti-Asian violence or the elections or the census, they were touching and engaging with our households on a regular basis. They helped connect the dots about why voting was actually important because every day people were tuning into the news and having conversations like, oh, these people are making decisions and it's impacting my life. 
And so it's really because that holistic infrastructure and resourcing that was already there that I think even though we we're still dealing with the increase of anti-Asian hate, um, we're, we're able to still be able to shift and modify our resources and react to that um, time period. The other thing I also want to know is that when 2020, everyone kept saying like, oh, look what Georgia did. Or look at like Nevada. The, once again, these invest, this didn't happen overnight. It's because of the long-term investment. I remember when uh, Asian American Advancing Justice Atlanta, which was called ALAC at that time, and then um, ACDC in Nevada, they were just thinking about starting it as a nonprofit. And because of Sue's trust in API vote, I presented to her saying, we need to think long term and in some of these areas where these communities are growing. I want to go ahead and invest in these two nonprofits. Of course, she did her due diligence and asked all the questions, but reality, a lot of those nonprofits, they had a budget of maybe twenty-five or thirty-five thousand. But it's because of her trust in API vote and the vision that these nonprofits had that we were able to get them the resources. And now they're they're what three there some of their budgets are three to four million dollars. I'll say uh, in reference to Christine, she said, You need to think about Nevada. I go, why? She goes, Because there's so many Asians going there, Los Angeles and everywhere. The community is growing like crazy, it's just increasing. Because I want to introduce you to a lady who sold her state farm agency to be able to set up a center for Asians. Mm -hmm. so I said, Hi, Vita. So why'd you sell your State Farm Agency? She goes, because our community is growing every single day. They have nothing. They have no center. They have no senior center. They have no gathering place. So I said, well, I guess if you can sell your State Farm Agency, we can invest in you. So from a 990, which is a tax return of 2015, she had raised 32000 most of it from Christine. In 2016, we went in with 300000 to help the organization grow. And we did that year after year after year after year. Because an organization has to have the security to know that funds are coming in. At the end of the day, the funds are your paycheck. I try to convince my staff. I never had more than 13. I now only have six. I always knew I was sunsetting. Because at the end of the day, people have to understand, you grantees, if the foundations did not have you existing, there'd be no foundations. You're the reason foundations exist. Therefore, it was really important for me to tell all of my staff, when we send out a check, it is the payroll check. It's not for fun. It's not for an activity. It's the payroll check. So when we get a check out, that is the most important thing you can do for your day. So Christine would lead me to states and organizations that were new and refresh growing together, forming together. And she would say, you need to write a check. And I said, OK, <laughs> we will. And that's how we expanded the AA universe. Thank you. But great. If I could just add Please. one thing. you know. With the rise of anti-Asian violence, I think in 2021, there was initial investments, larger investments into the community. The thing is I'm, I'm worried about is that it may just be a blip, right? It's like now that we're no longer in the news, will those same investments continue on with the community? And also, um, I think a lot of those investments were also short term because they're, and obviously they need to in, in some capacity because you have to deal with you know the victims and prevention, but it also is about trying to convince those same funders to invest in civic engagement, connecting the dots that for you to stop Asian hate, there's actually multifaceted policies and resourcing that needs to be done. And to be able to do that, we have to actually increase voter participation so we could put pressure on the elected officials to do what we need them to do to invest in our community. Yeah, that's so, so well said. And so much of this resonates with me too because when we're talking about invest, investing in this infrastructure that supports our relationships with one another, as you know, Tavai was um, doing a beautiful job explaining, it's, that's the way we're both able to respond in a timely way but also think ahead and build for the future. And if that infrastructure isn't there and it's not reliable, 
we can't do either, right? And um, I wanted to go back to you, Rio, um, briefly and just ask a little bit, you know, one of the things um, in, in knowing how NUIFC has been a voice for our urban Indian communities and organizations for a long time now, it wasn't until after all this kind of organizing around the census that we did together uh, that I felt like there was this real movement happening in your network around the civic engagement space. And now I think you just got back from a gathering with your Democracy as Indigenous initiative. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and what you, what you were hearing at that gathering? Yeah, absolutely. So the Democracy is Indigenous uh, did, uh, the Democracy is Indigenous initiative is uh, our cohort of urban Indian nonprofits that we've been funding now. This will be our third election cycle. We started in 2018, and it's kind of built around this idea that the simple truth that Indigenous values are powerful, they can be transformational, and that civic engagement must include the Native perspective, the urban Native perspective, because we're the ones that are going to be really impacted by the results of the elections and the policy that kind of come from that. Um, it's also to remind non-Native folk that if they're making political strategies, civic engagement strategies, and not including our perspective, not having us at the table, it's not gonna work like they think they want it to. It's going to fail, it's going to leave out large populations, and they're gonna sit there wondering why it didn't work out the way that they did. Um, but at the end of the day, democracy is indigenous. The idea of it is that we are giving our organizations that we partner with the resources that we can and then stepping back and allowing them to lead. They're the leaders in the community. They're the trusted messengers. They're the voices in the, they're the ones that know how to reach out to the community. We at the NUIFC do not uh, ever try to parachute in and tell them you need to do this, you need to do that, um, or give them a checklist of items or projects that they are expected to work on. We give them funding and then we step away and allow them to use their experience and their knowledge to um, mobilize their community in a way that only they're able to. So, you know, heading into 2022, we're going to build on a lot of what we were able to find successful in 2020, providing resources, merchandise, handouts, connecting them with other national organizations, and then from there, just being uh, a voice, being able to be a backstop for whatever they need us to do. So our biggest goal right now with this work is to make sure that they are empowered and know that they have our support on whatever initiatives they want to take on. And then really to just sort of be there in the background and being offering that support. You know, we trust them fully. We know that they are the champions in their community. We know that they know already what they uh, need to do. They're adaptable. They're resilient. Uh, I think in 2020 in particular, they showed that they can, on the drop of a hat, be able to turn around, create new ideas, create new initiatives, especially in the in light of COVID-19, be able to shift an entire uh, civic engagement strategy online and then create COVID-19 safe events and stuff like that. They show every time, every challenge that they can rise up to meet it. And it's just our job to give them the resources that we can and empower them and make sure that they feel emboldened to do whatever they think they want to accomplish. Great, thank you so much. And it's, it's exciting to see uh, that whole new level of infrastructure and support out there. Um, we're starting to round out our time. I wanted to see if our audience had any questions and answers. I believe we've got a, a microphone coming down here. Does anyone have a, a question or a, for our audience or for our panel? Be shy. I know people care about this issue. Uh, yeah, you can uh, my name is too. Nathaniel Brown. Look up, Kiani, this is as a Um I'm really interested in getting more of our Native Americans, Asian American, Pacific Americans in office um, at the in Congress and the United States Senate. In Arizona, we did have a, a young Navajo lady running, but unfortunately, you know, some of these lawsuits and the opponents, um, you know, they, they, they strategize very well and attack our candidates. And, and I know Nevada, you know, Mercedes is running. I know Miss Lynette Gray Bull is running in Montana, and we do everything we can to support them. So how, well, what are some of your recommendations and some of these organizations like Coulter and others? Um, how do, uh, I know it's about grooming, but in this day and age, how do we protect them, make sure that they make it and that they're there on the, on the ballot? Thank you. Thank you. you want to take one? I, don't, I don't think this is going to answer all your questions in particular, but what's very important for you to hear is that we have to get our people into office. 
whether it's Pacific Islanders, Native Hawaiians, Native Americans, Asian Americans, we have to get more of us in office. So what is the bottom line? One of my uh, CBOs, community-based organizations in Oregon, seems to make so many of their staffers elected. And I said, how do you do that? Because I can't seem to get all my other community-based organizations in other states. And he says, we let them keep their jobs. Why should they have to lose their job and their benefits to run for office, which is to help the community anyway? So we adjust their schedule. We give them flexibility when the legislature meets. And we let them keep their jobs. I thought that was fantastic, powerful. I would encourage all of you. The best people to run for office, guys, is organizers. Okay? They know the issues of the community. If they've been organizing for civic engagement, they absolutely understand the threats, the opportunities, the challenges. So your community organizers should be the ones that should be running for the, for the community. Because at the end of the day, they are running for office for the community, for all of us. So I would say, encourage your staff, your members, your community members to do that. And I would say, your people will also turn out. And let them keep their jobs and let them, therefore, benefit the community. So I would say that is an answer. In reference to protection or so forth, I would imagine that, unfortunately, whether it's racism or just plain hate, uh, will, unfortunately, approach these, some of these elected officials. Just real quick, mm -hmm. would love to have a conversation with mm -hmm. you afterwards. I think part of it is that we need to learn from the tri caucus or quad caucus at the federal level that we need to do that at the state and local level, especially when we have candidates. If we can make sure that the native and Asian AAPI candidates um, are working together and we also get plugged into that ecosystem so that way other allies, whether it's the women's groups or the unions and others, they can actually help make sure that we protect these candidates as well. If you, did either of you want to jump in on that one? Or? I would say, especially on the note of protection, I think one of the most important things is to face um, those attacks that are going to come, the racist, misogynistic, those attacks head on. I think there is a tendency and a belief among like a large segment of, pol of politicians or political thinking that it's better to just avoid those, don't keep shedding light on them. If you, if you avoid it, they won't talk about it. Try to shift the conversation to what you want, but to be really uh, forthright in addressing those, to run at them head on, and to make sure that you're counteracting a message that is attacking um, with you know, who you actually are, what you actually stand for. Don't allow someone else uh, define the candidates that you're hoping to see elected in the office. I mean, EPIC doesn't really do candidate work. I think I, I recognize that some of the limitations around being a, a C3 or being fiscally sponsored by a C3 is that seen as inherently C4 work. I think what I feel really challenged about and want to be clear is that I'm not supporting someone just because they're PI, right? I think we've actually seen a lot of cautionary tales from our community about folks who purport to represent us because we share the same identity. I was like, I don't actually need to share the same identity with you. I hope we share the same values, right? That it's not enough for you to be PI. I actually need you to be pro-black, pro-indigenous, and very clear, and so I appreciate, right? I appreciate Sue's note about organizers. Yes, it's a capacity and skill set they have. There's also a politic and a value and agenda that they're pushing forward that our communities can get behind. And there's this other component of like the protective aspect of needing not just an individual who's gonna have to go to these hostile environments and carry all of us. It's like, how do we actually build an entire team and ecosystem around them so that the burden of representing and fighting with our communities is not solely upon them, right? That actually charismatic leaders don't last very long in the places that we need them to go. And so what are the environments we are building to, that allow them to thrive? Uh, great points. Um, okay, I think we have time for uh, just the two who are at the mic. So uh, can you please introduce, introduce yourself and ask a question? Uh, hello, I'm uh, Johnny Buck with the Na'a Elihi Fund. And I uh, appreciate the last comment. Uh, it's about C4 and building the, the ecosystem of support uh, for civic leaders. Um, 
uh, currently there's a lot of uh, C3 organizations doing civic engagement, um, but very few C4 organizations. Um, so support to build that infrastructure to um, uh, support our, our communities to have C4 organizations uh, to do uh, lobbying, uh, direct candidacy, uh, support, um, uh, and policy. So I think that's really important, and I think there's uh, a lot of support uh, needed for that and movement currently uh, for that to happen, especially here in Washington State with the Native communities. Yeah, I know we've heard a lot of that in Indian country, as there's a lot more interest in it. Did anyone have any thoughts on the movement around more C4 infrastructure? Yeah, I was going to say, I, one of the um, NUIFC member centers, the Native American Youth and Family Center in Portland, Oregon, I know just recently launched uh, the NAIA Action Fund, which is their C4. Um, Will Miller runs, uh, heads that up. He's fantastic. And uh, I, he was speaking at our conference just a few weeks ago about what the C4 has been able to accomplish. He sent over a list of like legislative achievements, the amount of legislative action days they've had, um, you know, the ability to change the name of a, uh, a local hockey team's mascot uh, and stuff like that. Just all this work that they've been able to get done through the C4. So um, not so much an, an idea of, you know, just stating an agreement and kind of the ability that C4s actually give uh, towards nonprofits that are able to build them up. Um, you know, the lobbying they were able to do, the, the legislative priorities they were able to emphasize is really, really special. And I think 100%, like you had said, there's a lot of um, versatility, there's a lot of power in those new C4 organizations. I think I would like to give you some general information. You have to first have a powerful, stable, financially resourced, well staffed C3. You have to have the C3 first so that they provide the stability, they provide the infrastructure, they provide the capacity. Just for your information, in 2016, when Coulter started to go direct in 25 states, we had two C4s that existed, one in Boston and one in Washington. In 2022 now, we have 18. And the reason is the C3s have to exist first, they have to be supported, they have to be stabilized, they have to learn civic engagement, they have to understand the power of voting, they have to have connections with their elected officials, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and then it would be natural to perhaps start a C4. So in reference to information, guidance, look at the C4s in your, in, if your community doesn't have it, then in the Asian community, in the black community, in the Hispanic community, the C4s already existed, but usually it's much after the C3 has been formed and working well. All right, thank you. Um, I think we have one, one more question. Oh, me? Yeah. I'm with Johnny. But uh, oh. part of what we wanted to lobby for is land back and a rollback um, in just racial policies that are uh, built into city planning and that we elect tribal leaders and uh, leaders of color who have the understanding and policy background and support from our C3s in our community um, to erase some of that old language that says certain people can't live in certain areas. The, you know, the old, old policies that are actually written into that need to be eradicated, cleaned out, new definitions, new, you know, we've got to fix that. We've got to stop the harm and then we've got to heal, um, kind of backfill with the, how we do land planning and how we um, not just uh, consult with tribal nations and, and communities of color and our, you know, our community, urban communities, because a lot of us are living here in the city, but uh, that we are aware of those old policies and that we correct them. And so I, I want to just tie that into the work that NAP is doing and put my hands up for everyone who is doing the work. I really appreciate your wisdom and sharing with us today. So thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Well, we're coming at, uh, toward the end of our time here, but I wanted to offer everyone um, the opportunity to share a closing thought briefly because we're, we're getting at the end of our time. But um, what would you like to uh, leave the audience with today? I guess for me, ladies and gentlemen, when you are at a table, see who's not at the table and basically ask who is not here because they are the people that have to be included whether it's a community-based organization or any other entity. Guys, vote. 
Voting equals power. I know that each and every one of you want to build a powerful organization to be able to, like pivot for a pandemic and so forth. Only strong organizations can do that. So get your people, your community, your families, your neighbors, and everyone to vote. Thank you. Um, building upon that, I would um, challenge everyone to think that how you can integrate voter registration and engagement into your pre-existing work, into the constituents that you're already serving. So that way you're not seeing this as an additional burden, but it really should be integrated in your everyday work. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. I mean, given this audience, I think there's a couple of things. Um, one, if you're an API funder, I think Eric already spoke to this, right? The uniqueness of culture being that there are actually PI organizations that are funded. So I think the challenge and the question that I put forth to folks who are under the assumption that they fund the API community is to actually disaggregate that and understand that there actually a, there is a necessity for dedicated Pacific Islander resources and to actually check if those dollars are getting to the Pacific Islander community. And the other piece that I want to reiterate is the importance of funding an ecosystem. Um, oftentimes, I find myself being pulled in every direction. I think, as, as Sue's talking about tables, I really appreciate there's a, a Micronesian poet, uh, Carol Ann Carl, who says, like, they carve tables, we carve canoes. Right? As a people who understand that we're carving canoes because we have to move. We have work to do. And that if you can't find us at the table, we're probably in the canoe talking to each other. And so I talk about an ecosystem and needing to fund an ecosystem. It's so that I only have to play one role in the canoe. That the work that we do is reflective of our strengths and not the dearth of organizations that have been invited and resourced to join us. And so if there's an understanding that what it means not to just fund an organization, but an entire community, I hope that's what you leave with. Um, I would say the biggest thing for the NUIFC, one of the things we really do stress to our organizations, and I would stress to everyone here, is the importance of always uh, looking for other organizations to build power with, to organize with. Um, you know, the NUIFC, one of the stipulations of the grant that we've required that Sue asked for is a requirement to be working with and looking at and connecting with other communities of color. Um, I think that is one of the most important things that we can be doing, uh, that our urban Indian nonprofits are the most proud of, and you know, being able to connect with the Latino population, the black population, the AAPI uh, population, that's one of the most important things we can do as a community and as we continue to build power. Sue, so on behalf of all of us, I want to express our gratitude for all these critical investments over the years, and please join me in thanking our panel for a wonderful conversation today. And I am now going to ask our panel to go ahead and exit over here, stage whatever this is. I never get that correct. Um, and I'm going to ask my colleague, uh, Pat, to come on up to help uh, close us out today. Pat, can you grab mine, too? Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, wasn't this really a wonderful, wonderful event, yes? Woo! <laughs> All right. So, you know, I need my glasses. I can't see anything without them. OK, can you still see me? <laughs> I can see you. All right, this final plenary, thank you, Eric. I know this was a labor of love. Um, <laughs> it was for all of us. I think, you know, it is such a powerful, powerful call to action for funders. And when I sat here and I listened and I thought, yeah, I knew all of this, right? But it is really like, that's what this room is about. That's what this conference is about, right? We started talking about power of, we started talking about power of solidarity, and we're really ending, and we showed that, I think, over the next, uh, over the past couple of days, and what a powerful conference. Um, this call to action for funders, you know, uh, to reverse decades of underinvestment, to place big bets on the power of solidarity. That's why we're here. And so we end by 
by thanking our sponsors for making this event possible, right, as a starting place. Um, there are so many to name, but we're gonna um, just shout out our rainmakers. Um, the four big um, foundations that um, became our rainmaker sponsors, Henry Luce Foundation, Marguerite Casey Foundation, Serdna Foundation, and the Walter H. Coulter Foundation. Let's give them a hand. Oh, right there, okay. But they're not the only ones who place these bets on us, right? This is how many. You saw that uh, big you know, thing in, in the registration area filled with so many names. There are 61 sponsors of this event. Woo! Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I think we were calling it like the cubes or something like that. But every morning when we'd go down to the um, staff office, I, I really just, I had to stand there for a minute and just uh, reflect on all the work that went into things like finding 61 sponsors for a joint conference like this. And I think one of the most important things we need to do right now is to welcome our teams to the stage. And I'm gonna say a few things on our behalf. So if we can have as many of our NAP and APIP staff come join us up here, we'll stand up here. And as they're making their way to the stage, Yes. We have had so much wonderful feedback this week about this conference. Alan, in, in, make Our AV run. team is probably uh, uh, trying to figure out this last minute uh, stage change here. So. <laughs> But while we're arranging ourselves, um, we've had so much wonderful feedback this week about the conference. We're so pleased how many of you have been inspired by our organizations and networks showing solidarity by gathering together. By gathering together. But those who've really been practicing this solidarity in the deepest way possible and making this a reality are the staff. I would ask, um, I, I, uh, I would uh, like to ask both, oh, the AP, they're all, okay, you're behind me, sorry. <laughs> Going in the, um, the, the real, the real world work of the solidarity really happens day to day. You know, uh, we have a big job at our organizations, and all of us are running programs every day. We're answering, you know, calls and emails, and we decided to do this whole joint conference thing um, together. And this is no easy task. Um, this involved two organizations coming together with mostly new teams to build trust together. Everything was done in solidarity. Our fundraising, our accounting, our conference management, and our programming. As I've told many, every member of our team could now teach a master class in how solidarity looks in practice. There were so many meetings, conversations, long days and nights to get us there. And they honestly did this in the background a lot of times when Pat and I were having to deal with a lot of other things. And when we got here, I was teary every morning just seeing what they had accomplished. This incredible celebration and gathering was a result of this, so please join me in standing to congratulate our teams. Um, I also uh, want to uh, thank some of our sponsor, or some of our other partners who made this such a success. Tuttle Co, Co our digital engagement and streaming partner, for making this such a wonderful hybrid success. Thank you. Encore, our sound and video. SH Worldwide for our decor and furniture, and our photographers Canyon and Ron. And, uh, and uh, another one just to congratulate the staff, our hotel staff for feeding us and hosting us here. Hmm? 
Oh, yes. And, and Rally, uh, our communications firm who supported so much of this. Thank you. Right. Yes. Really so appreciated many. your support. We know that it also takes just a huge team and many more um, to pull this off. Um, so thank you again for everybody and my heartfelt thanks as well to all of the folks on here. We became one team and that actually is the power of solidarity, right? You know, um, so the other folks that I want to thank or one, one more thanks is to the weather gods. <laughs> you know, you know that Seattle uh, is not famous for its the kind of weather that we've had here. So it, all the stars aligned to um, bring them forward as well, and they're all with us. Yes. So for me, this really was from the very beginning. I described this to people before we got here as an immersive experience, bringing together Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, Indigenous. Native communities to celebrate the wisdom and love that are hallmarks of our communities. These, to me, are renewable gifts to philanthropy, steeped in traditions and values of generosity and giving long before the sector called philanthropy was ever established, yes? And you know that. That is the power of this room, and that's the wisdom that we bring uh, to it and the generations that had come before us that we carry forward. So we hope that you had a chance to learn more about Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander communities, indigenous Native communities, and saw the strong connection that brings us forward with renewed hope for what is possible when we work in solidarity with one another. It is such an honor to be here with all of you, creating a unique experience and a new marker in the shared history of our two organizations. Together, all of us here, not just the folks on this stage, but all of you, all of us gathered here at this gathering have made history. And so don't forget that, right? That is now part of our history. Yeah, it's so beautifully said because we started this week uh, in conversation about uh, the, all of this happening at a conference. And you're here at that next moment I really feel for me personally that we created a new space in philanthropy this week. As a space where we celebrated the diversity of our cultures, a space full of intentional relationship building, a space where we led with our strengths and not our challenges, and a space that has the power to inspire and shift the field. And now, we will rest. <laughs> Our, our teams will be taking some much needed time off, but when we return, we are committed to continue this momentum together. Fol uh, excuse me, following this conference, our organizations uh, are, are, are following this conference, our organizations are committed to providing new opportunities, uh, uh, new opportunities for all of you to join us in learning and power building together in the sector. We'll need a little break now, but please join our organizations and members as members if you're not already, and follow us to keep this movement growing. Soon you'll be receiving a survey to share your experience with us. Please fill it out. I know you get these solicitations all the time, but we have all enjoyed hearing your feedback on the floor. We need to be able to document that so that we can learn from it as we think about what else we're gonna do together in the future, and that is our commitment. We're, we've provided some box lunches for you in the hallway um, for your outside journey home. I know I speak for all of us in the feeling that the power of solidarity is strong. Bring it with you as gifts to pass along to others as you leave this space. And our teams together wish you a very safe journey home. Thank you. I'm gonna reiterate what Eric said. The first step as a call to action that you all can do is become members of a pip and app. Absolutely. Easy. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> so I'll, I'll